Good morning. It was March 22nd, 2018, and I was just about to drive home from another outbreak investigation. Like a fool, I checked my email one last time and saw a mysterious email from my supervisor at the Illinois Department of Public Health, or IDPH, about rat poison. I got home about 9.30 that evening, and the next morning hit the ground running on an outbreak investigation unlike anything Illinois has ever seen. The day before, the Illinois Poison Center had notified us of four patients who presented to Chicago area emergency departments with severe unexplained bleeding. They had blood in their urine and their stool. They were, had nosebleeds that wouldn't stop, and they were vomiting and coughing up blood. Mike Wall, the Poison Center medical director, told us, I have been here almost 20 years, and we have never had a cluster of people bleeding out before. As part of our investigation, we learned that all four patients reported using synthetic cannabinoids, and that one patient tested positive for a chemical called a superwarfarin. And then we got two more patients reported to us, and then five more, and then four more, and then 10 in one day. And then two patients were identified in a completely different geographical area of the state. And then I talked to a patient who tried to walk two blocks to the hospital and collapsed on the way. Fortunately, he made it to the emergency department after being discovered by a passing patrol car. And then a death was reported to us in a patient who left the emergency department against medical advice and was later found bleeding out. And we were scared. By the end of the outbreak, we had identified 174 Illinois residents suffering from severe bleeding after using synthetic cannabinoids. Over the next 12 minutes, I'm going to discuss some of the challenges that we faced during this investigation, and I'm not gonna pretend that I have solutions to all of them. But what I want you to do is to start thinking, what would my group or department or agency or organization do if this happened to us? What role would I play if this happened in my geographic area? The communicable disease section at IDPH has the most experience conducting investigations into these sort of rapidly escalating situations. And so we took the lead on the investigation. One of my first steps was to Google super warfarins and quickly, very quickly familiarize myself with the topic. Super warfarins are long acting rodenticides that work by preventing blood from clotting. So mice and rats and rodents that consume these die from blood loss. Exposure in humans causes a similar outcome um, with patients who are exposed, suffer from excessive and continued bleeding, just like we were seeing in our population. Exposure can be fatal, and treatment requires high doses of vitamin K for a long period of time. And vitamin K is actually incredibly expensive. Some of the patients in our um, outbreak investigation were being told that their vitamin K would cost them $34,000 per month. My next step was to Google synthetic cannabinoids, <laughs> which I'll call K2 from now on. K2, also known as spice, fake weed, synthetic marijuana, and about 700 silly brand names, is a group of psychoactive compounds that are synthesized in laboratories. They are either sprayed on dried plant materials that can be smoked, or they can be dissolved in liquids to be vaped. And they're readily available in convenience stores, smoke shops, from dealers, and online. Very few of these compounds are detected on routine drug and toxicology screening. And associating these compounds with marijuana is incredibly misleading because even though they act on the same brain receptors as traditional marijuana, that's about where the similarities end. 
K2 can be up to 85 times more potent than marijuana. And because there are hundreds of different compounds, people who use them really don't know what they're getting. To quote Bruce Anderson of the Maryland Poison Center in an article published about this outbreak, none of these products has ever been tested on humans. Using them is a spectacularly bad idea. <laughs> As we thought about how to approach our investigation, we learned that the legal status of K2 is really complicated, and it felt like we got different explanations from everyone we talked to. Eventually, we gathered enough information to proceed as if K2 were illegal, at least for our purposes. But the fuzzy legal status really added to the confusion at the beginning of the outbreak. Um, I actually, we had no idea who to report this sort of potential product contamination to. And I actually have an email from someone at the FDA asking if we had a lot number on a packet of K2. <laughs> One of the key questions that needs to be answered in any outbreak is how are people getting exposed? And traditionally, that is often um, determined using a traceback investigation on a suspected product. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, we really weren't able to hone in on one particular product or batch that looked suspicious. A total of 57 different brand names were reported to us by patients during interview, and very few reported only using one. 70% of our patients reported using K2 once a day or more often. We also learned that there's a high amount of variability in the packaging of K2. For example, the contents of a packet of Scooby Snacks could be exactly the same as the contents of a packet of Diablo, and vice versa. The con contents of any two packets of Scooby Snacks could be completely different. We also heard anecdotes about dealers offering discounts to their clients for bringing back their empty packets so they could be reused. Um, now, I can appreciate this environmentally friendly approach, <laughs> but it didn't make our job any easier. In most outbreaks, public health agencies have the authority to send someone out to pick up product for be test, to be tested. And we started the K2 investigation assuming that we would do something similar. But that's not really how it worked. Uh, IDPH did not want its employees carrying around an illegal product. And a well-established chain of custody was necessary to get product to where it needed to go for testing. We also had no idea who had the ability to test products. Um, the Illinois Department of Public Health State Lab certainly doesn't have that capacity. Ultimately, when a patient reported specific information about their product to us, we passed that information on to the Illinois State Police, who in turn passed it on to law enforcement. Product would then be collected, and it was routed to the FBI and DEA for testing. So, Ask yourself, how would my group approach getting an illegal product tested as part of an outbreak investigation? Who are my law enforcement contacts? Who can do the testing? What are expectations in terms of sharing information between agencies? And that was really something that we struggled with, was how much information to share with law enforcement agencies during this investigation. HIPAA permits maintaining, or HIPAA permits sharing information with law enforcement agencies as part of public health emergencies, but we were really concerned about maintaining the public's trust. But because the outbreak was escalating so rapidly, because many patients were already cooperating with police, and because we were assured law enforcement was only interested in distributors and sellers as opposed to individuals who just used the products, we did share patient information and where they got their product with law enforcement during the height of the outbreak. 
So ask yourself, how much information would I be comfortable sharing with law enforcement during an outbreak situation? Who are your substance abuse people? We asked patients why they use K2 during interviews, and we got a variety of responses. Some of them underwent routine drug screening for their job or for parole, so with K2 they could get high without worrying about it being detected on their routine drug testing. Some used it to alleviate medical conditions, like pain and anxiety, and some patients reported that they were addicted or couldn't stop. And understanding, in any outbreak, understanding why people are exposing themselves is so important, particularly those involving illicit substances. Because do you, what do you think our public health message was during this outbreak? Yeah, stop using K2. Um, are your substance abuse contacts ready to very quickly help identify targets for intervention during these very high stress outbreak situations. As an epidemiologist, I sometimes start thinking of people in terms of numbers and risks and other abstract terms, as opposed to people with lives and friends and loved ones. And I suspect I'm not the only one who does that. This was a horrific illness. Danny described his urine initially as fruit punch-like, with progression to somewhat like ketchup. Just think about how terrifying that would be. Joel smoked K2 with some of his friends and spent the next week in the ICU wondering if they were going to die. Zachary made the mistake of traveling to another state and being arrested on a parole violation. His mother spent weeks worrying that her son would die because the jail refused to provide the vitamin K he needed. This is Robbie. Robbie and his fiance were rushed to the hospital one morning. Robbie never made it home. The man who sold Robbie his K2 is being charged with drug-induced homicide and faces up to 30 years in prison. So if you haven't already, start asking yourself questions. What would my group do in this situation? Who would take the lead? Who would my partners be? Do they know I'm expecting them to be my partners? Who are my poison center contacts? Who are my law enforcement contacts? Who are my substance abuse contacts? Who does what? What would my jurisdiction do if it had to very quickly get large volumes of an expensive medication to a population with limited resources? Who pays? So ask yourself questions, because I've barely scratched the surface here about the challenges that we faced in Illinois, which is why it's so critical to stop and think, what would I do? Thank you.